HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. With more than 30 weekly podcasts, HRN has something for every food and drink lover. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. We do more varieties and flavors of cheese than anywhere else on earth. By pushing the boundaries of what cheese can and should be, Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. So you don't shun the devil with your rock and roll load. Knows that country music's gonna save your soul. The devil runs his groove in them rhythm and blues that sound. It's gonna get you sun in the air. Welcome back to the Speakeasy. I'm Southern Teague. And I'm Greg Benson. Souther. Hey buddy, just the two of us today. What's going on? Well, uh, we are officially living in the future. The future is now. The future, Souther, is is here. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about this, but as of, I think, last week, White Claw introduced yeah. non-alcoholic White Claw. You can now walk into a convenience store, go to the beer section, and buy soft, hard seltzer. It is... we. It, History is finally complete. We did it. We've accomplished what we <laughs> okay. as a species have been building towards through millions of years of evolution. It's it's here. I think the listener is going to need just a little bit more clarification here. Please tell me what you're saying is that a company that created seltzer that has booze in it has now created seltzer that has no booze in it? Yes, that's correct. So if you've ever drank a White Claw and thought to yourself, oh my God, this is so refreshing, but I really wish there was no alcohol in this. If only there were some way to drink this and then be able to operate heavy machinery or testify in court. Well, now you can. So White Claw has created La Croix. Did this, is this a thing that existed already? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Non, non-alcoholic flavored seltzers have existed. Yes. <laughs> S- since when, when did, when did we as human beings come up with it? This seems I'm gonna have to check your math on that, Souther. This feels this feels like too complex of an innovation that previous civilizations wouldn't have been able to get there. Greg, I think what we have here is um, what used to be termed jumping the shark, <laughs> <laughs> and I realize that's probably too old a reference for people to understand. But there was a point when, on the show Happy Days, where the character Arthur Fonzarelli, a known cool guy in a leather jacket that rode motorcycles was somehow on skis behind a boat, jumping over a tank of sharks. And that was in an effort to get more eyeballs on the show. And since then, that term, jumping the shark, has been applied to situations like this where someone does something sort of fantastical just to get looks. Do you think this is just White Claw trying to get some looks? Surely they don't need to go into the non-alcoholic seltzer, flavored seltzer space as a known alcoholic flavored seltzer creator you know i would actually disagree Has any cocktails jump the shark is what i'm saying no i don't i mean i think that look we i don't think we've seen the bottom of this trend at all and i think and i think it's good like i've been on record on this show of saying that like you know especially as beverage professionals i think we need to applaud anytime someone chooses to reach for something that doesn't have booze in it versus something that does for whatever reasons that are personal to them um and i think that white claw has realized that this is a trend and they have a very lucrative and valuable brand and that 
there are people out there who will honestly, if they see this, buy it over a LaCroix or a Canada Dry or whatever other seltzers there are out there. Like Poland Springs. Yes, exactly. You know, what, what yeah, this is vintage. I, I actually foresee this being a relatively profitable arm of their industry. And you can tune into the speakeasy for updates. Well, yeah. a quick Google search shows that a 12 pack of the White Claw flavored seltzer non-alcoholic beverages clocks in at $18 retail. So, yeah, I think this is going to be ludic- ludicrously ludicru- lucrative for them. Stumbling over my words. Um, ludicrously lucrative. Because I yeah, think that's, a, that's not an easy Ludicrously one. lucrative. Because I think they have an audience who wants to drink their product. Um, my, I, I don't know. You know how I feel about NA beverages in general. I think that it's weird that we moniker them. I think the moniker is alcohol, right? Everything is NA until you add alcohol. It's not taking alcohol away that makes something what it is. So this just seems very, um, I don't know egregious i don't know what we're to, to attach to it i'm i'm gobsmacked by the whole situation um but but it exists things exist i honestly when you sent me this article i checked the calendar to see if it was april 1st i i had a moment of <laughs> doubt where i was like have i just lost an entire month like did i did i did i fall on the sidewalk and like my building just left me there for a month which they would uh they might you know paint over me or you know Give me a, a yeah. Give me a fresh coat of paint while I was lying there, and then I just woke up like Rip Van Winkle and got back into my apartment. I was like, "Oh, it's April Fool's Day," and didn't notice. But no, no, it's real. I didn't. I didn't even consider April Fool's. Uh, but yeah, it does seem too far fetched to be real. But it's real. Uh, to be honest, I think we should get a hold of some and give it a taste. Oh, you say that like I didn't try. You say that like I haven't <laughs> been trying really hard for the last three days to find some in Brooklyn. It's not here yet. I imagine it's still. Uh, you know, it's trickling down into the major markets. We'll, we'll get it well, out. Well, you know, here. it's very difficult to ship to all States if it's non-alcoholic. No, wait, no, it's totally easy to do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we talk about that all the time. Um, well, let's talk about a little bit of alcohol uh, to get off of that real quickly. You know, my uh, fourth season of my online show, uh, which we've now rebranded, we, we're now calling it Southern Hospitality. It was called The Bitter's Truth. So fourth season is called Southern Hospitality, hosted by Gush, which is a platform that hosts my show. Uh, we just uh, announced yesterday that we're going to kick that show off uh, later this month. So there's plenty of opportunities to subscribe if you want to be in my virtual show, an interactive uh, sort of uh, tutorial and class about cocktails and alcohol. And, uh, you know, it's the fourth season we're going into. It's really been fun to do. And I don't know, I'd love to, I'd love to have some people join us and, and be in the class with me. I mean, you've come and done one with I me. I have, yeah. It's a fun thing to sit in on. We we chit chat. We make some drinks. I think usually for the cocktail classes I teach, I have like two or three. I think I had like five or six in the class I was doing with you. So we were having a good time. So well, we're uh, expert level. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Don't try this at home. This is you know. Do this little. Do you put the little jackass warning before your thing? It's like oh do yeah, not, with that little guitar riff. Yeah. Do not attempt. <laughs> yeah. Do not attempt at home, even though you're doing this from home. <laughs> Uh, well, this is, you know, not my first foray into education. I used to be a teacher when I taught at the New England Culinary Institute. Some years ago, I taught uh, all manner of things culinary, uh, you know, butchery, ice carving, etc. <clears throat> so um, I'm no uh, stranger to the world of education. And plus, I've been teaching cocktail classes for years. But today, who's in the studio with us, Greg? Today in the studio with us, we have Tiffany Berrier live from Atlanta. Tiffany, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm giggling. <laughs> <laughs> You are all, always giggling. I think that's one of your uh, trademarks. But but I was I was trying to set you up there, Greg, for our, our typically impossible segues. Tiffany, known as the drinking coach, uh, is making quite a career out of being someone who teaches people how to make cocktails, and and that's kind of why we wanted to get get you on here and talk to you today. How are, how are you from Atlanta? I'm good. Today's a good day. It's a nice rainy day, and feels good. We're, we're working hard and having fun doing it. You know, we had a guest on um, recently, uh, Miss Frankie Marshall, and she does a lot of kind of what you do. And I want to create some parallels here uh, in the beginning, at least, to, to the fact that you currently don't have a, a work a day position. Is that correct? Yes. So you're a freelancer. You're out there kind of making it making it happen every day, and you're doing all manner of different things. Yeah, it's really exciting. Uh, freelance, independent, however you want to say it. I don't. Ha- I'm the boss. Well, I assume you're always the boss. Um, you kind of made your name in, in Atlanta uh, heading up uh, One Flew South, which is the um, 
oddly an airport bar at Atlanta Hartsville International Airport. But you you headed that bar and and tales of the cocktail made recognition of you as being the uh, I can't remember exactly what the title was, but best airport bar in the world. Is that correct? In the universe, that's me. <laughs> yeah, I did it. Uh, yes, that was that's where it started. I bartended, of course, before that, but that's where it, it really kicked off, and that's where I grew up a bit. And uh, yeah, hold it down for seven and a half years. Yeah, pretty incredible. I've only been lucky enough to go to that bar one time, and, and sadly, you weren't there when I went. Um, but you made your, made a name in a very un, that's an unusual situation. Talk to us a little bit about how running a you know world class cocktail bar in an airport works because I think that the bulk of us think that airport bars are uh, you know just sort of doing the mechanics right maintenance it's maintenance phase right <laughs> when I'm at the airport bar I'm just going to have like a highball or a beer on tap or I'm just moving through I'm not trying to you know have a cocktail experience but you you spearheaded that and now that's becoming more and more of a thing yeah I mean that is what it kind of it's a it's a truck stop usually when you're traveling and it's if you have time no one plans to be in the airport and have a highball or a beer. It happens in between time. And so uh, we opened in the beginning of what the word craft was even all about. Craft bars and craft spirits is when we opened the doors and people did not expect that experience. So it's really nice to catch people off guard. Um, the hard parts were, yeah, the unexpected. We are not in control. The airlines are in control. Traffic control is under control. The clock is in control. In control. So we were uh, challenged with hurry up and make it great, or we've got a few hours to make it great. So we are. We were a lot of things. Which the main thing was is we were just great hospitality. Um, you, you fall into a bar like any bar, whether it's on the street or in a hotel or an airport. You fall in and you're just looking for comfort, a place to just chill out. And we did that with like an aha moment. They came to chill with it and they saw what we were doing and they're like, wait, this is not my normal saloon. And uh, we prided ourselves on that. It was insane. So where do you, this would just never occur to me as a field to try and uh, to, to use a word that I think is vastly overused, disrupt. You know, I mean, if I were like using, I, I would almost... In fact, I've talked about like, you know what we should have at like Penn Station is a really nice bar. And now we have a bar that's nice for Penn Station. They're different things, but it's fine, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but it would never in a million years occur to me to be like, let's do a good airport bar because the the, the just sort of nature of that is traveling by air is very much just being shuttled from one place to another on someone else's schedule. And to me, a bar is a place where like, if I want to stay for three hours, I'm going to stay for three hours because you know, this is, I'm, I'm paying rent on this stool. This is my space. I'm enjoying myself. I'm here for me. So what, where did this germ of this idea even begin? And, and what were kind of like, walk me through kind of the, the genesis and some of the first steps you had to take. Cause I'm sure there were other skeptical people you would to convince along the way besides me. Yeah, I mean, to this day, we're still, you know, the chef and I, we hang out, you know, or bi-weekly whenever we're in town. And to this day, we're trying to figure out what were we doing? What were we thinking? What? <laughs> what in God? Why did we think this was a great idea? But, you know, you think about business in a sense and you think like you you want to fill in the blank. Any bar program, hey, let's do this, this theme this or, or you want to give guests something and we realized that we were sitting in a space that is open 24 hours, 365. We also realized that we were the busiest and largest airport in the world, busiest airport in the world, not largest, busiest mm -hmm. in the world. And this is the hub. This is the home of Delta. This is the corner, you know, of the universe that, or kind of corner of the U S that thrives. You can get anywhere in two and a half hours direct. So everybody comes through Atlanta and, I did not join the team until a year before we opened, but these guys had this logic idea. Let's give them something better. Um, and you don't know you want better until you get better. And you're mm -hmm. like, I needed that. I, I kind of deserve that. And, and we, and that was the vision. That was basically, we didn't really have this blueprint. We, we wanted to remind ourselves, which we always did every day. We are a restaurant and a bar. It just happens to be an airport outside of us. We are not a restaurant bar in an airport. 
And that's what we wanted the guests to understand. We are normal. We were not normal, but we were normal people doing normal bar and restaurant things, but we're giving you something that you didn't expect. And the airport is a place that people are not expecting great anything except get in, get out, um, maybe get drunk. <laughs> yeah, I think you said it well with, um, you know, you, you, you don't know you want better until you're given better. And I think that it's odd that, that that place has done so well while you were there, obviously, and since you've been gone, given that the airports have, I think, turned the other way. They've gotten worse. Now you have those uh, stations that you're not even inside the bar. You're at a table that's got an iPod mounted, uh, iPad mounted to it, and you place your order w- with a nameless, faceless person, and something just appears. And, uh, you know, the, the quality's gone down and down, I think. Um, in favor of convenience. But that's where you kind of made your name. Um, how do you think that you, um, as, you know, running ostensibly, again, an airport bar, how do you think you got that recognition and that notoriety that that sort of catapulted you in what seems like a few short years into 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 the zeitgeist and into it right in front of everybody's face? Like what what took you out of One Flew South and into, I know they changed the name and I can't think of it right now, but the Dame Hall of Fame, what took you into being on the on the tails of the cocktail board? What took you into being a, a guest judge on Drink Masters? Like, how did you? It seems like a catapult. I know I get asked these questions all the time as well, and it seems to me that my answer is always like, "Well, it happened the same two ways that it always happens: first, very slowly, then very quickly." But what was that catalyst that jumped it from slowly to quickly? Um, you know, we were kicking ass at the restaurant. We were getting the awards and the recognition. I went from working a normal bar shift to becoming like a mythical creature people didn't know if this is a real thing is this a real person a real thing like people are adjusting their flights people are like making a point to come through atlanta to see not only this restaurant but the bar um my chef was killer he is killer but it was the bar we were we were the eye candy of the building and my energy was pretty high because hell i was having a great time at work also i mean my guests are not just one side. They're, they were all over the country. I was learning so many things. My menu was not seasonal. My menu was just, <laughs> it was whatever I wanted. You know, if it's winter here, it's summer over there. So I wouldn't, I wasn't able to do that. I mean, of course, using my ingredients, local worked, but my mind was insane with trying to always keep up. And I was reminded one day that I'm an airport bartender. Meanwhile, looking at my friends in New York and in San Francisco and in Miami, that are having these like, larger than life bar programs that I thought, I thought that I wasn't, for lack of words, I thought I wasn't smart enough because mm. people were like, you're just an airport bartender. So attending, you know, functions like Tails and whatever my USBG was offering and any kind of educational uh, space I could be in, I wanted to be there because I wanted to be a great bartender. Like most of us when we first started, I wanted my bar to keep up with everything. And um, after leaving one to the South, which I left because I didn't know where the next level was. I mean, am I going to stay a bartender forever? Which that sounds kind of cool, but I just knew that I had a bit of spark that needed to be outside of my little sandbox. I just, people from all over the world were coming to see me and now I want to go see them. So that's what I did. I'm like, I want to go see what you're doing and go work at bars. Initially, I wanted to consult and, you know, open other bars that were just as, you know, pivotal like mine. But um, that wasn't the case. Life had something different for me. and. I just continue to educate myself like nonstop, read and go to everywhere, travel, this distillery, this cooperage, wherever I can go, I'm going. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I don't know. I mean, my story is basically, I mean, there wasn't a lot of people that looked like me in that space, not just women, but just women of color. Um, and I got a pretty funky personality. So that, 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 that makes for some fun. And so I just have been continuing to be invited in some really good places and learn a lot from some of the masters of their craft. And that made me just make the drinking coach even more because the ultimate goal was for me to learn everything so I could teach it to someone else, you know, whether it was the consumer, whether it was other bartenders, um, and, and also for myself, of course. So uh, when you're independent and you're learning so much, you're, you're a creative, you're an artist, and you just keep you just keep dabbing in places. You keep stepping in and stepping out and, and speaking up or sitting down. And um, that has led me to be all over the place and recognize in that space to, 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 to hold that space, but also um, gain respect in that space. Well, yeah, you certainly have a lot of respect. And um, 
I, I want to ask a little bit more sort of directly, you know, when did you make the switch from learning mind to teaching mind? And how did that, like, how did that go? Like, I think we've been having a lot of guests on lately who, again, like you sort of break the mold and you're not just strapped to a bar, you know, like I was for, for so many years. Um, you, you're out and about and you're doing things. How did you make that flip? I think a lot of our listeners are curious about our industry at large, but they don't necessarily want to just be pigeonholed into the one job. And, and you have many, many jobs. <laughs> so many jobs. <laughs> so, I still don't know what I do. Um, cause I do it all. Um, lack of places that have great cocktails. Uh, I don't always drink a cocktail. I can make a hell of a cocktail. I don't always drink them. I want meat. I want a beer. I want wine. Um, but I just saw a huge hole in great cocktails in certain spaces. A lot of those spaces were uh, black owned, or there was a honestly, it was just a black bartender who was just like, it just has to go like this. Like we do this and this and this, and that's what we drink. And I was pissed. I'm like. They didn't know some of these bartenders and some of these places who were offering a vibe didn't have any structure behind them, didn't have any like true bar culture behind them. It was always just a one note. So I I really wanted to not only lead by example, but teach other bartenders of color. Like, we don't want sweet. We bitter's a thing, you know. Have you ever stirred something before? Hey, you know, ice is different. I I just saw a hole. I'm a problem solver. And I'm a pro- when you see something missing, you just want to fill in the blank. And so that's where my teaching kind of sharpened in certain places where I was like, I know enough. I mean, I've ran a bar. I've had great food. I've traveled the world. Let's share it. I didn't want to be in front of everybody like, oh, that's Tiffany. She's got these awards. She worked here and there. I was like, yeah, but let me come back. Let me bring it back. That, that was my story. But let's get in here so you can understand and be just as um excited and curious about the things that I learned you can learn too so my teaching mixes from bartenders to the consumer I'm in love with the consumer like <laughs> so into them yeah they they seem to be the most um fascinated they want to see behind the curtain you know they want yes. they want to they want to have that look um but I I'm still kind of curious though like how did you like technically make that leap from, you know, I have a job to go punch in and be behind the bar, or I have to set myself up in such a way that people will ask me to come to their bar to teach them. <laughs> a leap of faith. <laughs> I just, <laughs> yeah, I just saw a cliff. I didn't have a plan. I just jumped. I just jumped. I knew it was going to happen. I just didn't know when. I trusted myself. I trusted my gut. I trusted hospitality. Mm-hmm. And people are always saying things like, you know, let me know if you need anything. Or if you're in town, come by. Or if you ever have an idea, you know, run it by me. Who knows? We may partner. And I started to think about that. Like this hospitality world, this industry says that they're here for you. I thought, okay, well, <laughs> let's see if you're here for me. And I jumped. Y'all, I had no plan at all. I had an idea. I had a daydream, but there was something in my gut that was like, just stay, just, just keep trying, keep asking, but stay yourself. Let's not step back. Just stay yourself and put yourself in rooms where you can get that question. Can I help you in any way? Do you have any great ideas? I, I, um, I LLC'd my name. I LLC'd my business. I, you know, I made it a thing. And then I just can stay consistent with my, my consistent with my presence. I continue to talk about booze and history everywhere I went. And I made a point to represent who I was in those spaces every time. Somebody bit. I mean, people bit. It also just came a thing, as you know, people just expect that of you. If we saw you with brass glasses on one day, we'd be like, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> what? Why did you change your glasses? Like, what? Mm. What? What? what, what is it? And so if I were to come in a room trying to blend in, then I wouldn't stand out. So I just kept, I just stayed with my story and stayed with my testimony that there's a missing link in culture and cocktails, there's a missing link of women in cocktails, there's a missing link in just like having a, a normalized conversation about what we do on and off the bar um, and being approachable and authentic about it. It just wasn't enough of it. It was, pre- it was pretty, pretty beige in that room. It was pretty stale. 
and I was sticking out. And so my leap was just keep sticking the fuck out. Just, just keep doing it um, and do it for you. Maybe someone will like it. Well, I, well, and first of all, I just want to say, I love your, I want to highlight your point about the LLC and listener. If you, if you take anything away from this show, it's that if you're trying to do anything like on your own as a freelancer, get, get an LLC, get it yesterday. If you can, like, don't, don't listen to whatever Southern and Damon and I blah, blah, blah about just internalize this one data point, And I promise you, your life will be so much better. Um, it helps. It it's, totally it's very affordable. Does. And even if you can't LLC it right then and there, just something someone told me a long time ago, go get the domain, just get the domain. I have probably 10 domains. They're probably not going to work, but they're mine. It's just an idea that I had. And I'm like, Oh, domain it. That way, whenever it does, whenever the water just, you know, goes over me and my flowers are like, oh, we did that. It's already there. So never think that your idea is, for one, your idea has not been done because it's only one you. There's that. Um, but you're the name that you think of. What, just do it. Just lock it down and grow towards it. I often have gotten stuck in my head about someone's already done that before. Absolutely. Someone has done it before. But remember who you are. You have never done it and you can always insert yourself into what is the same, but different because of you. I love that. And I, I'd like to, if, if you're cool with that, I'd like to dig down a little bit more on something you said earlier about the idea of like creating a more welcoming space for, for black folks behind the bar and, and sitting at the bar drinking. Um, because, you know, this is, this is one of the, I always talk about this whenever people ask me about the word mixologist. I don't like that word because I think everyone everyone feels comfortable at a bar that has a great bartender. Not everyone feels welcome at a bar that has a mixologist behind the bar. You know, there's just mm. something about that word that word, the way that it's coded, I feel like it creates it's this unnecessarily fancy word that creates gates and barriers. And and I don't like that. I like, you know, I like creating spaces where where everyone wants to feel welcome, but I feel like folks like Souther and I, you know, we, we have blind spots just based on the way, the way we walk through the world and the faces we get to wear out in public. Exactly. And I, I guess my question is like, where do you, where do you begin changing that? And, and what can the people that look like Souther and I do to help you in that process? You know, it's all about the angle. Um, there's a, there's a, I just, uh, a few weeks ago, finished uh, Rick Rubin's book, The Creative Act. And one of the chapters in the book talks about a point of view, basically a perspective. You did a perfect segue to that, Greg, because the word bartender versus mixologist, right? So I used to be like, don't call me a mixologist. I'm a bartender. I tend my bar. Don't make me that way. But what you just said was really nice because like, yeah, people do feel comfortable with bartenders. They don't always feel comfortable with the mixologists. Yet, years ago, in the early 1900s, um, being called a mixologist was like an honor. The DC Mixologist Club, which was a group of Black men who were serving constituents at this time, the DC Black Mixologist Group was like pristine because people didn't want to go to see the bartender. I don't want to see him. He's just, nah, I want to see a mixologist. I want you to make me something to make me feel some kind of way. And so, yes, it does seem a little pompous now because it's like, eh, I'm not that, but you can be, and you can also be that and be as giving, you know, it's just kind of the way it's received in the point of view. If, if I put a bow tie on, some people connect that to this bow tie means I'm going to a formal event. Some people, like Black people, put a bow tie on and it triggers, I got to go to work. So it's just a really a point of view of how you look at said word or space. And the bartender space, because we served for so long, not just Black people, but because the service industry was covered in nothing but Black people, because that's the only job we could really get, or that's what you wanted. Um, we honor it, but sometimes we don't want to honor it because we don't want to be the help anymore. We want to be on the other side of the bar, a lot of, well, older people that I know don't feel comfortable sitting at the bar because they're like, we're sitting at the bar? I'm like, we're sitting at the bar. Like, yeah. absolutely. That's still a thing. This was like yesterday to some of us. It's like yesterday to our culture. So it's really just, I mean, helping the community, yes, but more so understanding the community's 
processing of it all is just like difficult yet um we're working on it I'll just say that we're working on it because my family for sure was like you're gonna bartend your grandma's just stopped being a maid like 10 years ago are you kidding me and I was like but she didn't understand like you gotta and then I do this and people smile and I get paid and they're like you you are, that's not what it is. However, my point of view, because I'm extremely optimistic on life and extremely positive on things, I thought, well, that's what it used to be. I'm going to be what it is. That's, I, I have a voice now. I have an opinion now. I can be creative. I can feel strong back here. And that's something that I try to implement to everyone that's a bartender in general, because the service industry has been treated like crap, but also bartenders of color who are like, is this good for me? I don't know what to do. I'm serving this, you know, this white person. And I feel like, am I bringing it back? I'm like, you're bringing it forward, honor that space. Like you are the best at what you do, bring it in. So it's just truly about being, making them feel comfortable, but also looking at their perspective of what this was and what it can be right now. So it almost kind of sounds like maybe the, maybe I've been looking at it wrong, maybe by trying to, and I think a lot of this also is, you know, uh, uh, it's stuff I need to work through with my therapist. It's imposter syndrome. It's like not wanting to put myself on a pedestal, et cetera, et cetera. Like, you know, that's why, because mixologist does have for better or for worse, a fancier, more learned, more kind of like involved, like this isn't just a part-time job. This is a career connotation that bartender does. So maybe I've been looking at the whole thing wrong, maybe by creating a space where this is a craft that's that's appreciated, but also has a relatively, and I don't mean this as a dig, but a relatively low barrier to entry where kind of, you know, it's not like you need a graduate degree to be a bartender, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it almost kind of creates the, by setting the bar of how high you can rise higher, versus the level at which you can start, we create a greater range for people's careers to expand into. Am I am I kind of hitting mm -hmm. that right? Yep, hitting it. I mean, we're so humble as bartenders, right? We're just so humble because we're giving and receiving. You think it's valued if you want to be the best at what you want to be. You are a mixologist. You just don't want to walk around like we we know those folks that are like I'm a mixologist look at me this is what I am I'm not a bartender anymore and that's valid you feel like you've worked your craft there's layers to everything there's levels to everything so if you feel like you are a mixologist then be a mixologist like kill it knock it out but if you are a bartender be a good you're a good bartender and if someone calls you a mixologist I, I personally think it's whatever you want to be called. Whatever your whatever your liquid pronoun is, <laughs> rock it. I don't I don't care. Uh, you rock your liquid pronoun and and be comfortable with it. But I I I like you. I mean, I felt the same way years ago, and I've been interviewed a million times. Where what do you want us to call you? I'm like whatever you want to call me. Just call me my name. Just make sure my name is spelled correctly. Um, I, I think it's just a point of view, like you said. And it's I don't think you were doing the wrong thing. I just think that you were like, well, you know. I, I am kind of good, <laughs> but I can be, I can also be this and also make people feel very comfortable. I want to be that. I mean, a great bartender makes you feel good on multiple levels in their artistry and the way they do it is a part of it. And that is mixology. I can't believe I just talked about mixology like that. That was deeper than I wanted to be. <laughs> Listen, we get we get right to the core of the issue here on Speak Easy. We always have it's a spirited award-winning podcast right here. It's that hard-hitting well, news people tune in for. That's right. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. Wisconsin, the state of cheese, makes half of the nation's specialty cheese and wins more awards than any other state or country. Our heritage and traditions master cheesemaker program and the American propensity for innovation all put Wisconsin on the cutting wedge of cheesemaking. With over 600 varieties of cheese to choose from and 5,500 national and international awards and counting, get ready to turn your refrigerator into a trophy case. Enjoying a Wisconsin cheese is basically like winning a gold medal in culinary achievement. 
Set your mind at cheese. When you bite into a wedge of Wisconsin Wonderful, you know it is made with the ultimate skill and passion possible. Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. I'm Lou Bank. And I'm Greg Benson. And this is an ad for Ancestral Agave Syrup, the critically acclaimed award-winning syrup that helps gringo bartenders better make margaritas, wait, wait, Negronis, Lou, hold and up, hold up, wait. old Are you just, fashions. This is how you start your podcast. What? It's not an ad for Ancestral Agave Syrup. Well, of course it is. I'm just cutting costs. By not paying writers to make something new, I'm just using an old script. You pay writers? Is that some kind of jab? No, I'm just saying what, that... What What are you saying? Well, look, we've got this amazing syrup that's made in an ancestral manner, cooked down from the sap of the agave, harvested the way these families would to make polke. It's a quality product. It deserves yeah, a yeah. quality presentation. Yeah, okay, okay, hang on. <clears throat> ancestral agave syrup is made by real families following traditional methods. Unlike the industrial Blue Weber syrup you get everywhere else, Ancestral is cooked down from Aguamiel, harvested from Salmiana in Hidalgo, Mexico. It is the grade A Vermont maple to the sticky diner syrup you've been using for your cocktails. Ingredients matter both in how your cocktail tastes and how you treat the earth. Ancestral is better for both. Is that good? Uh, sure. Or maybe confusing instead of cheesy. Uh, look, just visit AncestralAgave.com to learn more and to order your world-class agave syrup today. And we'll call that a wrap. Catch you next ad, Greg. Uh, Hasta pronto? Ancestral Agave Syrup. Available online at ancestralagave.org and wherever Greg and Lou are able to coerce store owners into carrying it. Speaking of the Spirited Awards, um, you took in a big one this past uh, session at Tales of the Cocktail and you gave a pretty impassioned speech that I think got recorded and went around uh, quite a bit. Um, I was there in the audience cheering you on. Can you talk about that experience and how that felt for you? Whoa, that was a day, right? I drank a lot of mezcal that before <laughs> that speech. So um, I was very, very, very nervous. Um, friend to friend and to everyone that's listening, I, I, who is okay with receiving an award? You know, Nobody. we don't, it's, it's not normal. It's not normal. Unfortunately, it's just not normal to receive a yay after 18. I mean, and you go to college. I dropped out of college. So I don't know about getting a master's degree or bachelor. So I just know my diploma. And it was like, yay, your parents take you out and yay. And then and then go do life. You know, you're not really celebrated like that, especially when it comes to work. We're celebrated individually in love and partners and friends, but work, no. That day and to this moment, I'm still, I still kind of watched how that speech has taken me in a place. My mom and I spoke this past weekend. My mother watches that speech on YouTube once a week. So that said, oh my God, I feel like I'm going to cry. That said, <laughs> that speech means a lot now because it's documented. I'm documented as a mm -hmm. bartender. Sure. What? Documentation as a bartender? Not normal. Like you've got a book. Yay. That's cool. We're on a podcast right now. We'll listen to this forever, right? But our stories of the service industry are just not documented. So the excitement for me being recognized um, with all the little boxes I check and black and gay and from the South, like all these little boxes that I checked on a characteristics point was valuable for me, but also even more valuable. Take out all like the fact that I'm of color and I'm queer and blah, blah, blah. I'm independent. I don't mm -hmm. work for anybody. Mm -hmm. Here's this girl getting up on stage, receiving recognition and respect from people I've looked up for eons as an airport bartender when they first met me. And here I am receiving an award and I don't, I don't, I'm not a brand ambassador. I don't work for a chef. I'm not in 50s best. I'm not, top, I'm not top anything, but top Tiffany. Fucking iconic. I was like, wow. So and I work in privacy. I work in isolation. I work in my own little space. 
So being seen was very, I was very exposed, but also it affirmed, wow, okay, we might be doing okay. Because I, as I said a few sentences ago, I want to stand out with my work. I want to blend in. I want to mm. be like, I'm doing that too. And I'm teaching too. And, and I want to be on this platform and on, you know, on this stage. So I want to be involved, but my strategy and the way I work is so different. So being recognized for that was worth all that mezcal. <laughs> worth all the mezcal. <laughs> it was worth it. It's hard work, but someone's got to do it. That's what we always say. That's right. <sighs> Uh, well, you know, I think well deserved, and and again, I we'll put up links on the uh, on the post, but people should go and watch the uh, the speech. It was pretty impassioned and uh, said with great uh, heart and emotion, and and the room was was overwhelmed by you because you're uh, you're a pretty overwhelming person um, when you get going, um, in, in the best of ways. Uh, but so 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 you took that in, but you also do a lot to give back, right? Um, you've been on the Tales of the Cocktail Grants Committee um, for for a bit. Are you still on that? And 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 if so, can you talk a little bit about what what work that is and and what the Grants Committee does for for our community at large? Yeah, big job. We're actually in the midst of it right now, We're reading many many LOIs right now for people wanting to um, get support for their daydreams. Uh, Tales of the Cocktail has been through many 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 crappy situations um i mean um, any any organization that's that big and has that much scrutiny on it and has lasted as long as it's lasted is certainly going to go through some shit i guess 100 percent. Right? <laughs> i i mean i wouldn't expect it i mean anything less but when they came back this time <laughs> this, that time uh, i think it was uh five years ago five or six years ago um, we decided to really, ch- they decided to really change this, this organization in many ways and they can try to change it as much as they can to throw some money out. Let's play, they're getting money. Let's go some money out. Let's mm-hmm. give it out and be intentional about it. So it's a group of 12 of us who read through a bunch of LOIs and try to make your dreams come true. Um, and it has to be obviously hospitality impacted. Um, but we see everything from the prop, uh, new, new, mecha- new machinery for your ice machine to, um, mental health and wellness and yoga and gardening and, and education, all in all, anything this, this industry is missing, um, people are wanting to fix. And so we had the joys of reading through all of these things and interviewing them in such a detailed, detailed conversation and, mm-hmm. um, and then helping to um, make their business really become a real business and, and connect them to the right, you know, mentors and, and people in business to structure their beautiful ideas because unfortunately, but fortunately, us bartenders, some of us don't have a degree. We don't have any business skill. We just have heart and mind daydreams and we put it in a glass and go. And when you want to take this daydream into a business structure and become a legend, uh, you need help. And so we get a chance to implement that help and take your business to the right place, along with give you thousands of dollars, yeah. thousands of like buku money, as we say in the South. Buku dollars, I mean, anything from um, ten thousand dollars all the way up to a hundred thousand dollars. Can you cite an example of an uh, of an interesting project that you were very that you were very happy to to fund and and how they're doing now? Yes, one that's dear to my heart. They're out of Atlanta, Georgia. A sip of Paradise Garden. Um, the the founder of Sip of Paradise Garden was a competitor for MIB. Most imaginative bartender with Bombay Sapphire. And they have this like part of the competition where you have to share your creative outlet. She grew up in a garden. She's a Liberian American woman. And um, I was like, I just want to play in the dirt. And so she used to complain about how come purveyors always go through the back door for the chef? Why don't they ever come through the front door? Like, I want to see what herbs you got. I want to see what product you have. And so, um, because we ended up going back in the kitchen anyway, going through the walk in anyway. So, like, come talk to us. So she really wanted to create a garden space or a space that we can grow everything we want to drink um, from fruit, veggies, herbs, spices, and what have you. And um, she did not win the competition. So she did not win the winnings that she wanted, but she was still so steadfast to do it. She started the garden here in Atlanta um, on her own dollars and then sent in a beautiful LOI uh, three or four years later and reading it because I knew about it, but reading it and seeing uh, the dedication and the want for this, not just to get your hands dirty, but to also offer a safe, a brave space and a place for yoga and a place to sit outside and just chill mm-hmm. was really nice because those bartenders didn't have enough of it. And um, man, it was hard. It was just heartfelt to read what she wanted to do. And it was nice to 
give her some coin for that. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. How many people sit on the on the board with you, and how many uh, applications would you say do you get per per <laughs> session per per season? There's twelve of us on the board um, right now. We have eighty five applications. That's shockingly low to me. Do you yeah. think this is because yeah. people maybe don't realize that this exists? I think people are intimidated by the application. It's something that we talk about ourselves. I mean, again, I have an idea. Now, can you type that in all of this paperwork? Can you give mm-hmm. us a structured LOI? Can you give us where your money would go? What is the accounting going to look like? I think I think some people get intimidated. Um, in the beginning, we didn't have that many. It's kind of it's fluctuated for sure. Um, and I can't speak for why people don't want to submit. I think people get scared. I think they think they're not well, going to get it, or there's favoritism. So I hear an opportunity here, Tiffany. Maybe it's too late for this year, but maybe next year, you and I, we pitch a seminar at Tales of the Cocktail on how to um, apply for these things. I would love that. And we now have help to do that. Someone can actually hold your hand and do it. So you talk and we just put it in. We can definitely, I would love to do that and so we can give more money out. That also gives more money, but also for sponsors, it makes them want to give us more money too. Yeah, let's find that as well, right? Like that's that's the other side of the coin. Um, how do you... Talk to us just a little bit. I don't want to hear, you know, the minute by minute, but, uh, you know, the daily life of Tiffany Berrier is to, I've always said, I I think the hardest job to have is looking for a job. Mm -hmm. And someone who works independently is constantly looking for a job. So talk to me a little bit and our listener a little bit about like, what's, what's the day to day like for you? You know, if you don't have somewhere to get up and go to, Maybe you become a little demotivated and you sleep in a little late later each day and then suddenly you're not getting up till three in the afternoon. You know, how do you maintain a little bit of discipline and keep yourself motivated to go out and keep finding job after job after job? Yeah. Um, wow. I, I, the day to day is, is the day to day is a blessing. I will say that. So I, 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 I am honored to wake up every day and open my computer, walk into my office, which is next door to my bedroom. Uh, walk into my office <laughs> down the hall convenient and uh, <laughs> I commute uh, after my dog walk um, no and open my email and and and, and see what see what's going on um, I do take a little bit of time on social media to take a peek and see what's trending what's going on who's doing what make sure we're not being blown up anywhere I don't have to fight anybody I don't have to burn it down um I, I make a point to check that first and then um I jump into my emails great, isn't it it's like am I gonna have to go I to mean, war with someone on the internet today to, listen my line every morning is am I gonna have to burn it down <laughs> um I'm a kind woman I'm a sweetheart everybody knows it but I will burn it the, I will sabotage this whole place is rigged with explosive just t- try me <laughs> I'm try ready to go me. one just flick and I'm ready to burn it down. So um, once I find out I'm not burning it down or someone else is burning it down for me, um, I get, I get right into it. So I do, I am disciplined. I have lived my life before being independent, not so disciplined. So you get tired of being lazy. You get tired of procrastinating. You get tired of, I just got tired. So I'm a grown up, believe it or not. Um, and I work from a certain time to a certain time. I'm, I have boundaries. I'm very good with them. I work in privacy and I work in isolation. I have to remind people of that. So I've got to stay on it. Um, I am looking for jobs, but more so, honestly, my friends, I'm looking to perfect jobs. I'm offered jobs. Hey, we want you to do this. And I'm like, actually, I'm going to do that. This is That sounds great, but that's just too basic. I think we should do this. And that's the part of my business and who I am that inserts a bit more culture, a bit more fun, or a bit more just not so stale cracker. Um, but I work. Uh, <laughs> that was my nickname in high school. <laughs> I know it. Was. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't. Um, I'm, I, I, I'm I love obedient. this though. So what you're saying is you get a job offer and you counter offer with a better job. <laughs> I do. I I play tennis. I my job every day is to play tennis. I am blessed and I am not boastful and I don't have an ego about the opportunities I get. But I don't take every job that I get offered and I'm also not. playing tennis. I love to read a beautiful email and then say, What about this? Because that keeps me on my toes. Um, and that keeps my brand my brand. It keeps the event different. You invited me. 
So I got to be me or else you'd invite them. And I don't know who they are, but my well, job you is shape, to You shape it around yourself. There's no reason for them to ask for, for, for you and then not get you, right? If they're right. just asking for your name, then maybe you have to remind them of, of the thing that you are as well, right? Yes, I have to then remind them that my intellectual property is another thing. You just can't put my name on it. Those are things you learn by being burned and, you know, seeing yourself or your workplaces. It's just, a, it's, a, it's things you have to learn. So being independent, I'm everything. I am HR. I'm creative. I'm hiring. I'm firing. I'm invoicing. I'm, I'm everything, but I have to stay obedient to my day so that I can be all of those things. And you get a routine after a while. You, you make sure you don't have your martini until 1230 versus <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> standards. You know, standards. listen. You, you see, yeah, you, you just don't start drinking immediately. You just stretch it out. Oops. Yeah, mm-hmm. I have an underburger right when I wake up every day. Uh, that's that's, a, that's 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 coffee. That's different. That's just uh, that's different. That's, that's, that's an that's, herbal. And that's a you know a supplement. Yeah, yeah. An herbal my, that's supplement. My little giddy up in the morning. Yeah, it's wake up <laughs> drinking, not power down drinking. Uh, well, you mentioned yeah. you mentioned right there, and I want to dig into a scratch at it a little. I don't want to dig into it because I don't love to, and I know you don't as well. I know you well enough to know that you're very positive. But you did say you do a few things to make sure you don't get burned. Have you been burned? And what would you caution people to look out for to avoid getting burned? Burned. I've been singed. I've been definitely burned. Um, I've been burned a lot. I right, right where I am now and what people see is a lot of hard work. Um, it takes, you know, as we know, it takes 10 years to be an overnight success. That's right. um, we have had this conversation many a times that I have been doing the same thing for years. You just recognize it. They just happen to be like, oh, my God, your, your work. And I'm like, mm, I, bruh, I've been at it for since, you know, 96. Like, it's been a minute. Um, so you learn. I being older now, learning your le- learning from those lessons is valuable. But preventing being burnt right now is where we are as adults in our businesses. And preventive maintenance is important, like legal, like having someone that can just read over contracts, um, having a squire somewhere in the corner, you know, they'll do it for free. Just, hey, lawyer friend, would you do me a favor? Would you read over this? Um, and, and they'd be more than happy just to read through it because a lot of these contracts Come and they're just standard. I've had contracts come to me with someone else's name on it, and I'm like, "Oops, my bad." I, whoops, yeah, because you sent this con. I've had you know just really sloppy contracts come my way, which have burnt me. I've not read them. I've gotten excited about very little money because when you're independent, you're poor, and you're like, "Well, this sounds like a great amount of money because that's my light bill." So, as bartenders going into shifting your business into a business, uh, you you. We're, we're so used to whatever you give me because we're so kind. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate mm-hmm. it. And then we put it away. But when you start to value your work more, value yourself more, or you become a bit popular because you've competed somewhere, or you presented somewhere, or you are alongside of somebody who's pretty, you know, um, Insta famous or what have you, you just have to have things aligned so you don't get burned. Again, having a squire, I'm not rushing to say yes immediately, asking questions. And if you don't know what kind of questions to ask, then take a beat and say, can you just give me a minute? Um, and let's think about it. You know, having things covered, your flight, your hotel and a per diem does not pay Georgia Power. That pays for you to get there. How are you going to get paid? Who takes care of the dog? There's things like that, that you have to take into consideration. And take it from me, who is super humble and nice, who um, doesn't know how to ask the right questions, um, or doesn't like to put a a price dollar on who I am and what it costs. Just be real. Let's let's just get real, real and put your big draws on and say, what is my rent? What is my car note? What is my habit money? (laughs) What is my (laughs) Manny Petty money? Mm-hmm. what is my dog's name? Like, just add up a couple of things that you must have. What's your, what's your, you know, what do you like to do? Hell, if it's just the money that you want to buy a new pair of Jordans, how much does those pair of Jordans cost? All right, buy two of them. That's how much you're going to charge them. Think about your lifestyle and you're working to get paid and to not get burnt. You have to make sure you know your worth and knowing your worth is looking at your finances and asking for your finances to be paid. Um, 
Yeah, as a, as a somewhat independent myself, you know, I, of course I have my my company, but you know, the company at large doesn't uh, turn a lot of profit, so I don't make a ton of money from that. Um, it's just a lot of work. Um, mm-hmm. But I do my online class, and I've uh, I, I write articles, and I um, you know um, uh, I made hot sauce, you know, all the dumb things that I do. I try uh, to sort of extend what you're saying beyond the sort of um, weekly slash monthly needs. And I just say to myself, well, if I were looking for a job, I wouldn't look for a job that paid me less than X per year. So mm-hmm. how many jobs do I need to do at the price that I think I can get my job done for to reach that goal? And is that possible yeah. within a year? <laughs> right. I love that. Yeah. Stretch it out even more. Um, you know, I just I, I wouldn't ac- I wouldn't accept a salaried position that didn't tell me what I was going to make for the year. So I have to decide what it is I want to make for a year. And then I have to plug in enough jobs to achieve that goal. So amazing. That's how you look so cool. I'd love to dig back into like something that that you were saying earlier about like getting into these patterns, like, you know, like you have to hold yourself accountable to doing the work. Like when you're a freelancer, no one's going to do it but you. And I know that that's something that I personally struggle with a lot as a bartender in my 20s. And I'm sure that anyone who's listening who's born after like 1998 I would be willing to bet that they are having the same. I know, right? People born in the 21st century can drink now. It's fucking wild. Um, but uh, but I feel like they're, they have to be wondering, like, okay, cool. Yeah, it's great to say that. Like, it's great to say, like, and I always used to resent this, too, when people were like, well, if you want to get more done, just get up early. I'm like, oh, it's just that simple. Like, I just... I set an alarm and then I just magically lose the desire to hit snooze <laughs> 18 times until it's one in the afternoon. So I guess, and I think it's particularly tricky in our field too, because I think that this field is attractive to people who are smart and dedicated and creative, but lack a little bit of that innate ability that we're told we need to have to be like, you know, good productive members of society. I hope people listening can hear the air quotes in in my voice when I'm doing that, because that's just inherently difficult for us. I think we're drawn to this field where you get to be smart and creative and personable and think on your feet, but you don't have to do a lot of planning for the future. You know, you know, when you show up, you know, the latest that you're going to leave and all you're doing when you're at the job is just reacting. You know, you're just reacting to the circumstances and it doesn't require you to have a Google calendar or a budget or, uh, you know, a, a, any of these things that we've been talking about. So I guess where would you suggest people get started if that's a thing that they're looking to to make a jump for? And I'll, I'll give my answer and it's just very quick here. Therapy. But what is your answer? Mm. Mm. God bless you, therapist. God, we love you. You know, listen, we're all so different, right? And I think what we have experienced only comes in experience, like in knowing you, you, you're not tired until you're really tired. I think it's just a matter, yes, therapy, but knowing who you really are and what you really want. If you're lazy the three times out of the week and then you're like, I've done nothing, let me do something. Okay. Let's own it. Let's own who you are. Let's get things done in those windows. I think no, I I know knowing who you are and how you operate is going to help you then trying to keep up with how other people operate or what you you yeah I, you gotta just know how you roll and then with what you have do it do what you can with what you have and I, this is my favorite quote: Do what you can with what you have where you that's are. That's all you. That's it. I, yes. Okay. That's fine. Do what you, if, if you continue, which unfortunately we are constantly comparing ourselves to people because we have the, the access to do that, but um, do what you can, what you have, and then be done. And then when you, when you get that little, you know, that jogging going, you're like, you know, that's really good. It's like, I'm going to use Instagram as a great, as a great example. You make up, so people are really social, some people are, but let's say you make a really cool post and everybody likes it, right? like man I did that (laughs) that worked do I do one tomorrow or am I good like when do I do another one you know if if you're finding that that great post that great content worked out for you and people really loved it you've been fed some energy you've been Mm -hmm. fed some affirmation so you're like okay maybe I'll do this once a week maybe Mm -hmm. I'll oh maybe I'll build on it even more oh maybe next time I'll you know you just kind of kind of pick pick up how you roll 
how, how, what excites you and then stick with it and feed that thing, feed that excitement, feed that momentum. Trust me, when you feed your momentum, your momentum makes you money and your money will be like, man, we're we're doing it because we're being ourselves. We're doing what we are doing to make it work. And that doesn't have to be a seven day schedule, nine to five. uh, It can be whatever you make it to be because that's the, that's the, the beauty of being independent and being all about yourself. Make yourself happy, but do what you can with what you got. Like, be easy. Well, this has been tremendously enlightening, and I wish we had more time to talk, but we got to wrap it up. Um, I think, uh, but but I love this. I, every time we have an episode like this, where I keep, I want to keep talking, it just means that we have to have you back for one thing. But it also means it's, it's a riveting episode. So, really glad to have had you on, Tiffany uh, from Atlanta. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, where can people follow along with you so that they can see your shenanigans or your doings or or um, what 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 you get all the pies you have your fingers in? Yeah, my shenanigans are usually on Instagram. Sure. <laughs> I'm not a gram girl, but that's where I post. It is a free place of marketing, and I like to share other people's stories. Um, so the drinking coach on IG, um, also on Threads. That's a thing. Um, my website is thedrinkingcoach.com. It's pretty standard. It's a nice landing page for anything you want to do outside of like what you're doing, but uh, maybe I want to book you. Maybe I want to hang out. Maybe I want to do a virtual class with you. Maybe you want me to, you know, come to your house. I don't know, but that is where you can find me. I'm extremely approachable. Don't think any idea is too big or small for me. I um, am very intentional in my work and I love making new friends. Um, there's a book coming, so you'll you'll see that later. Ooh. But either way, um, breaking yeah. news. Mm-hmm. We're writing a book. There's a book. We're coming. writing a book. What stage are you at in that process? Uh, I'll know by tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> uh, I've got three or four bites on my proposal. I've had three proposals. Okay. I've been writing this book for a pretty long time. But yeah, I've been writing a book for a while. It's put a couple of different hats on it. Thankful for Miss Tony Tipton Martin who dropped her recent book. Jazz Juke Joints and Juice. I was a major collaborator to that mm-hmm. book. Not major, but, you know, I helped a lot um, with places there. And it just, it did what she wanted to do. She wanted to be a little bump set spike for my book. And so now the pressure's on. So we're just fine tuning some things for this to be an amazing book that you'll probably get probably next year. Also, while we're leaking out stuff, I'm working on a really interesting sugar cube line. Hmm. Sugar cube? Talk about that a little bit. Right? Sugar cubes, right? What is that about? You know, my friends want to have syrups and hot sauce. and I love that. I love that. But there's something about the sugar cube and the person that wants it makes me very happy. Um, it's very uniquely used. Um, it's kind of seen in a luxury space. Some people wouldn't dare use granulated anything. And I want to capitalize on the sugar cube space. Um, I'm just, <laughs> it's not to be a millionaire. It'll be in places like, you know, hotels and workspaces and on a cruise boat. It'll be on a private jet. I don't know. It's not going to be, it'll be at Wild and Sonoma 100%. That's where it's at. But it'll be a little box of yummies, like a Tiffany box that you'll open and you'll be able to refill this with lines of sugars. There'll be box. cool sugars. There'll be weird sugars. There'll be really strange sugar. Who knows? It may be an unami. I mean, an unagi, like ill urchin sugar cube. It'll be like brown sugars that are all melanin. It'll be mm. rainbow sugars for pride. It'll be just something to get these flowers out of my head and put them into something and it's going to happen in sugar cube. I love it. Yeah, well, when you when you said that, I thought of that scene from uh, from Crazy Stupid Love where uh, Ryan yes. Gosling seduces Emma Stone, and that scene that scene is hot. So I already think that like if that's where people's minds, that's where my mind went. I think if when you say luxury sugar cubes, I'm I'm on board, and I happen to know a guy who runs an agave syrup brand. So uh, if you yeah. if you want, I can give you his, he's a little he's a little hard to get a hold of sometimes. He's uh, He keeps weird hours, but I can give you his info if you want. Yeah. <laughs> I do. I too keep weird hours. This is great. <laughs> it's him. It's me. Well, what a fantastic time talking to you, Tiffany. I can't wait to see you later this week. We're going to be in LA together uh, judging uh, at LA Spirits competition. Um, so we will catch up in person um, soon. Um, I know you're headed off uh, soon to go down to Charleston for Charleston Food and Wine Fest. You're going to fly to L.A. straight from there. So you're out there keeping yourself busy, getting up and getting after it. So 
Um, once again, thanks so much for joining us. That's it for this episode of the Speakeasy here on Heritage Radio Network. Please go to heritageradionetwork.org and click on the beating heart to donate to keep shows just like this one on the air so we can keep hearing stories from people all over the world about what they're doing in the drinks and drinks industry. Um, uh, so anyway, thanks, everybody. Cheers. 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 So you don't shun the devil with your rock. The Speakeasy is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network. Food and drink radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe. It's going to